in film, first moved to the States, I realized how much, you know, when I lived in Beirut, everybody challenged any piece of news or anything anybody told them all the time. And then I moved to the States, and I realized that. Oh, <laughs> That's another fun piece of work. Um, here's another one. Once upon a time, a land called Oregon, a pair of twins was born, the thrill seekers fire in the belly. No matter how hard they tried, they could not exist. It seemed that wherever they were, there was another part of our people inviting them to do something crazy. And so, one girl down the other. And so basically this project, in a weird twist of fate, found itself to Dan Wyden's desk. And I got hired at Wyden and Kennedy because of this project, not because of the design portfolio, not because of an advertising portfolio, but because of the conceptual piece. And he saw it, and he thought it was super, super interesting, and he offered me a job there. So I went out there thinking that I'm going to be there for just an internship. Um, so my lesson number two is just put your energy into the right places, and things just start happening. You know, don't worry about all that external noise. Don't worry about what a million people say. Just put your energy where you are passionate. Or again, back in um, 2002, I think, or 2003, the tagline for the state was things look different here. And the state had gotten to a point where they're like, yeah, things look different everywhere. <laughs> so they kind of really needed really needed to differentiate themselves instead of just say that they're different. So the campaign, which is still going on now, um, and it's called Oregon We Love Dreamers. And the whole idea behind the campaign is that, you know, Oregon kind of just attracts people that are idealists and that want to like do things that have never been done. And whether it's in food or it's in wine or it's in anything growing the perfect berry, it attracts the same kind of person. So it's this place where people go and kind of create this better life. This next one, I think it's going to be the girl effect.
That's another fun piece of work. Um, here's another one. Once upon a time in a land called Oregon, a pair of twins was born with thrill seekers. The best, and I'll talk about this maybe a little later, but I think the best projects are always not just the projects that allow you to work and be able to do what you're passionate about and be able to do what you're good at, but also do something good for the world and do something and add something that's more meaningful and more positive. Um, and I think you're, you're just like really lucky when those things kind of come together. Um, so this last piece of work that I'll show you. So basically, Nike came to us and asked us, they hadn't talked to women in a while, they wanted to talk to women. Why do you just spend all your time looking for new ways to get your heart searching? If you listen hard enough, you can hear the slant of Oregon whisper, why not? I worked on the um, branding of Oregon for about eight years, and we rebranded the whole state of Oregon back in um, 2002, I think, or 2003. The type of state had gotten to a point where they're like, yeah, things look different everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of really needed, they kind of really needed to differentiate themselves, just say that they're different. So we created this whole campaign, which is still going on now, um, and it's called Oregon We Love Dreamers. And the whole idea behind the campaign is that, you know, Oregon kind of just attracts people that are ideal. <laughs> okay, so third lesson is take a job for what you'll learn and the kind of people you're going to be around, the kind of people you'll meet, um, instead of just like, you know, for the big fancy, you know, they're going to pay you a lot of money or something. A lot of people that I went to school with ended up going for the money first, and a lot of them just didn't end up growing that much and didn't end up getting exposed to a lot of things. And, you know, in the long run, that ends up hurting you because after five years, seven years, what, what happens is the people that took less money or, you know, took the place that offered them more hands-on exposure to things end up growing and growing, and they become worth, worth way more. And the people that end up... And then I decided that I got to a point where I was kind of young enough but old enough to take some risks. So Um, so this idea of just embracing the unknown and not having, not needing an answer. I didn't know what was going to come next, but just enjoying kind of this time and traveling and getting new experiences and getting inspired again, you know, just get going out in the world. Like I cannot emphasize enough how much, how valuable traveling is. You know, I'll say it till I die. Traveling is one of the most inspiring things. If you don't have to have a lot of money to travel, 
find a million ways to travel. I think we did the whole road trip on nothing. Like literally we would like find little places all over. You know, we, we slept at a wolf sanctuary. We slept at this run down to Hefner <laughs> spot. Like you, you know, you figure it out, but there's so much that comes from traveling. And I would like, you know, when it widened, it was really hard to do a lot of that because I traveled for work a ton. But it was really hard to travel because you constantly were working 90 hour weeks and every weekend and your vacations would be because of work. So there's a lot of sacrifice that happens there. So, you know, just now and what I'm doing now, I realize like just traveling and how much that like brings into your work and how much it inspires. So, you know, it's really, I think the best, and I'll talk about this maybe a little later, but I think the best projects are always not just the projects that allow you to work and um, you know, be able to do what you're passionate about and be able to do what you're good at, but also do something good for the world. And then I'm also going to start just like all these things that I wanted to do at Widen, um, you know, all these ideas that I had in my head that I couldn't do. When I, um, so the last piece of work that I'll show from my Widen and Kennedy days are this Nike Woman campaign that we did. Um, and there's a whole project that basically I ended up calling the Wonder Clock. It basically is putting my biological clock online for every single person in the world to see. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> um, why? Um, I'm not sure. I just felt like I needed to do it. I felt like I wanted to kind of, I realized that there wasn't a lot of information, there wasn't a lot of conversations happening. You know, you grow up and all you're told when you're growing up is do not get anywhere near a man's penis or you will get pregnant. That's all, <laughs> that's all anybody ever tells you. They just get rounder, but not smaller, and that's just fine. It's a space heater for my side of the bed. It's my ambassador to those who walk behind me. It's a border collie that hurts skinny women away from the best deals at clothing sales. My butt is big, and that's just fine. And those who might scorn it are invited to kiss it. <laughs> Just do it. Like you know. Okay, every time I read that, I'm like, they ran that. And it was on the back cover of Vogue magazine. <laughs> You're telling women can you kiss my <laughs> Okay. So third lesson is take a job for what you'll learn and the kind of people you're gonna be around, the kind of people Hi, my name is Mira, and I'm ticking. I'm also living, creating, traveling, thinking, laughing, nurturing. Didn't end up growing that much, and didn't end up getting exposed to a lot of things. And you know, in the long run, that ends up hurting you because after five years, seven years, whatever it is, into a job, what happens is the people that took less money or you know took the place more hands-on exposure to things end up growing and growing, and they become worth way more. And the people that end up taking a job just because it's, it pays a lot of money end up being the people that like stagnate and don't learn a lot. And then in the long run, nobody's going to pay those people a lot, a lot more money. So it's kind of a tricky thing, but I don't know. I feel like it, it always pays off to learn as much as you can. So I was at 10 and I thought, okay, this is really interesting. I want to invite more women into this conversation. So I decided I'm going to create an app. So they created an app so every other woman out there could download her biological clock on your phone and watch it take down too. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I thought, okay, that's not enough. I want to kind of really, you know, I have no money for this project. It was a labor of love, and I tried to like save up money to do it. So how do I, without an advertising media crazy budget, how do I release this and get people to talk about it and start a conversation? So I went to Art Basel and I decided I'm gonna launch it there. And first in Art Basel in Europe and then in Art Basel at Miami. And then I decided that I'm gonna create an actual physical kind of security and comfort and all that stuff. Like I could have stayed there for another 10 years probably. But, and I'm gonna walk around and it's gonna be a performance art piece. And what happened was every single person wanted one. <laughs> get questions like, wow, cool, what is that? Can I have one? And then we'd start talking, and then they'd find out what it was, and I'd get, oh. So it was really interesting. Um, so that kind of, um, what happened is, you know, when I went first to 
Switzerland, and then I went to Miami. Every single Huffington Post, New York Times, every single you know newspaper out there ended up talking about this project and writing about it. You know, and here this time and traveling and getting new experiences and getting inspired again. You know, just get going out in the world. Like I cannot emphasize enough how much how valuable traveling is. Huge thing. So. Um, Traveling is one of the most inspiring things, and you don't have to have a lot of money to travel. You can find a million ways to travel. I think we did the whole road trip on nothing. Like, find little places all over. You know, we, we slept at a wolf sanctuary. We slept at this, these people's house that looked like Hugh Hefner, rundown Hugh Hefner <laughs> spot. Like, you, you know, you figure it out, but there's so much that comes from traveling, and I would like, when I was at Wyden, it was really hard to do a lot of that because I traveled for work a ton, but it was really hard to travel because you constantly were working 90 hour week training. So I did a yoga teacher training and I had been practicing at the time, probably practicing yoga for about 10 years, but I really got to a point where I just wanted to learn more about my practice, like just push my practice further. And um, I didn't know, I didn't. You know, there's a lot of things I've been practicing for a while that it's not like I could do scorpion, no big deal, um, super easily. So it was one of those things that I just thought, you know what, I'm going to do something that really, really pushes me and challenges me to a new place. And that was yoga for me. And what ended up happening is, yes, the physical transformation was incredible, but it was more of a mental um, transformation, just this idea that your head kind of telling you that you can't do things and then your body being able to do them really empowers you and I didn't realize at the time at the time I just did it because I wanted to learn more and I wanted to like you know learn more about anatomy and my practice and all that, for all these reasons and what I ended up learning after that is so much more than I got out of it so much more than what I started out wanting out of it um, and what happened is it kind of I could do things that I never thought I could do and that directly started affecting my work um, and Lesson number seven. All anybody ever tells you, they just want you not to get pregnant. And then when you start like thinking about and you know having them happen, it makes you think that anything is possible. So uh, that ended up being a really kind of um, just like just the the kind of work I was starting to take on, the kind of conversations I was having at work just became a little bit different. Um, so this is a funny little image off the internet. Um, uh, with a bunch of agencies and then what started happening is first I was freelancing for agencies and then I started getting more and more projects from clients directly um, but at the time I was working from home so kind of I created this project and first I created the website and then I'll read you this next slide just, so I just really realized that I kind of hate working alone and I like working with people and I love people and I love just what happens, that kind of magic when you're around people that inspire you and you create a place that, um, you know, where you can be around that. So I decided I feel that somehow at my core I'm failing, lurching towards a time, unless I turn to the wonders of science, when I'll be able, well, unless, oops, this is really blurry, unless I turn to the wonders of science, then I'll be unable to bear my own children. I created the clock to face my own fears, to beckon the elephant in the room, to release my own power, my own choices, to begin a dialogue with other women about fertility, empowerment, and, fault, and loving ourselves. We are women and we are taking, but we are so much more. So that kind of gives you an idea of what I wanted to do with the project. So I created a website and then I thought, okay, this is really interesting, but I want to invite more women into this conversation. So I decided, called it Red and Co. And then what happened is, Basically, just started attracting interesting things. And what before I move on to the next thing, lesson number eight is trusting your gut. Um, and the thing with trusting your gut is the more you trust it, the better it gets. It's not like you're born. You know, I have no money for this project. It was a labor of love, and I tried to like save up money to do it. So how do I, without an advertising, how do I release this and get people to talk about it and start a conversation? So I went to Art Basel, and I decided I'm going to launch it there. And first in Art Basel in Europe, and then in Art Basel at Miami. And then I decided that I'm going to create an actual physical, ticking biological clock that I'm going to strap around my waist. And it's just going to tick. 
and I'm going to walk around, and it's going to be a performance art. What happened was every single person wanted one. <laughs> and I would get questions like, wow, cool, what is that? Can I have one? And then we'd start talking, and that's what it was, and I'd get, oh. So it was really interesting. Um, so that kind of just um, what happened is, you know, when I went first to Switzerland and then I went to Miami, every single Huffington Post, New York Times, every single, you know, newspaper out there ended up talking about this project and writing about it, you know, and here I was like, you know, not that I've had this crazy history of art projects or I had, you know, any money behind this project, but it ended up being like such a huge thing. So um, my lesson here is make yourself vulnerable. At the end of those three weeks, they really loved all the stuff we did. So they said, oh, we'd like to continue another small. Don't try to do what anybody else is doing. Don't try to replicate. Don't try to imitate what other people. Try to kind of look inside yourself and try to find what's that thing that makes you special, what's that thing that makes you different, and try to show it in your, show it in your work. Um, so after that, I decided there's a lot of things that I was doing at the time, including just freelancing on different projects. One of the things uh, during this journey that I decided I wanted to do and I've always wanted to do that I had no time to do at Leiden was do a yoga teacher training. So I did a yoga teacher training and I had been practicing at the time, probably practicing yoga for about 10 years, but I really got to a point where I just wanted to learn more about my practice, like just push my practice further. And um, I didn't know, I didn't, you know, there's a lot of things and they wanted to, us to create all this work. And there was a lot of work that we had in there that not we've never done, that nobody's ever done. So there was things like, you know, connecting APIs and doing software development and doing apps that have never been done. And so basically what ended up happening is I have no idea why, but I, when they asked who you can know, do everything, I said yes. <laughs> and honestly, the client way, you know, way later, probably a year later after we finished all the work, asked me like if you knew the amount of work that was going to happen would you have said yes and I said no I think I had a chemical imbalance in my head and I said yes <laughs> and that's what happened it was a crazy amount of work and it was a crazy amount of responsibility and I'm not working with like a mom and pop shop down the street I had a 20 page contract with Google that I had to deliver on with a team of people that I trusted that you put us together and we're going to figure it out. But it was really, really one of those things that pushes you to a place where you have no idea if you can actually pull it off. So I'll just walk you through this work really quick. So basically, Google came to us and said, only 1% of girls are creating all the technology that we're using. Girls have no voice whatsoever in creating the technology that we're using, and that is a problem. It's a problem because literally, like, all these women do not have a voice. So how do we change that? We change it at the very young level. So we can start basically raising a whole generation of girls that want to code. And they don't have to do it professionally. They just have to know. It's like a language. It's like just another song. And I just really realized that I kind of hate working alone. And I like working with people. And I love people, and I love just what happens, that kind of magic when you're around people that inspire you and you create a place that, um, you know, where you can be around that. So I decided just on a whim, and it was another one of those things that just kind of trusting my gut and going for it. I mean, <laughs> the problem with that is that it's keeping all these girls from coding, but what if we change that perception? What if we stop talking about code as abstract numbers on a screen and started talking or I'm just going to start taking on projects from this place um, directly with clients? And what ended up happening is in a weird kind of, it's weird, again, going back to kind of when you put your energy in the right places and kind of trusting yourself and doing things that you just or kind of believe you should do is it ended up attracting things. So what happened is I started, I got the space in music, we called it Red and Co. And then what happened is basically just started attracting interesting things. And what I move on to the next thing, lesson number eight is trusting your gut. Um, and the thing with trusting your gut is the more you trust it, the better it gets. The more knowing how to trust your gut, but the more you do it and the more you kind of 
trust your gut, whether you fail or not, it doesn't really matter. It's just this idea of kind of listening to your intuition and listening to your gut and kind of trying, you know, to do that and stay focused on what it is you feel deep inside you is right, power of code. And suddenly they connect to it. Suddenly they start seeing how amazing this thing, this tool is, and they start actually wanting to learn it. And it's not that hard. It's not harder than math and physics and every other stupid thing that you learn at school. So it's actually once you start going, because what we ended up doing is, so, you know, normally you see code in movies as like abstract and numbers and zeros and ones. What we did is we worked with that I really love, programming language called Blockly. And we not only redesigned it, but we also changed it to the entire functionality. So you can actually start more interesting projects. You can actually go on the website and see um, how everything works. But I'm just going to play an anthem film that we did and then kind of talk you through quickly the website. But if you so we did, so what I what, what ended up happening is I kind of started building out this small team of people to work on this project. And it was only supposed to be three weeks and then the contract would end. And what ended up happening is we created, we came up with a bunch of ideas and we created this work. And then they basically at the end of those three weeks, they really loved all the stuff we did. So they said, oh, we'd like to continue another few weeks. So I'm like, okay. So the team, I'm like, okay, we might need another person or two. So the team kind of slowly got bigger. And then after those four weeks, they're like, oh, you know, we really need another four weeks. So the team got a little bit bigger. And then what ended up happening is within like four months, now comes, the world is made of bits of language, letters and spaces and numbers, organizing nations and brunch and love. The world is made of you. A replicable, particular you, who are made of tiny bits and words can you whose effect can be enormous, life changing, history making, world better making. The code to change is also made of tiny bits and bites come together to dig wells, share a joke with millions, get directions. You are a girl who understands you're done that nobody's ever done. So there was things like you know, connecting APIs and doing software development. Change something, or invent something, or run something. And maybe that's how you will play your bit in this world. You know, running code can do everything? I said yes. <laughs> and honestly, the client. So we did this big brand film, and then we also did 12 documentaries. Um, so I was kind of starting to mention, we found, and this was like a haystack, we had to find 12 women out in the world that actually code, six of them that were kind of older, you know, adults, and then six of them that were under 18, and we could not find anybody. It was like, you can't just Google women in technology, a bunch of pull up. So, we were literally, especially for the younger girls, we cold called every single school and organization we could think of to kind of try to find the most interesting women out there. And that was like a huge deal just to find these women. And then after we found them, we ended up doing a documentary about each of them. So Brittany, for example, cures, uh, helps doctors find a cure to cancer through code. Maddie works in fashion and code. Kenzie is a nine-year-old that actually just created a game with code. Um, Ebony just created um, a track for Jay-Z that got nominated at, for a Grammy with code. Tesca works in robotics and code. Um, the Taggart girls created an app to help them clean up their community. Aya has a company in New York that works with electronics and code and helps kids kind of be inventors at a young age. Danielle works at Pixar and all the Pixar movies like Brave and Finding Nemo and Cars and all of those are all made with code. Erica is the one that works, leads innovation at UNICEF and helps women and children around the world, helps them not die of HIV and AIDS and a whole bunch of other things and she uses code to make that happen. Robin works in gaming and code, Morale works in dance and code, and Lamar works in um, also kind of uh, hardware and code. So we kind of created role models, and that's what you know this whole industry doesn't have. They these girls are really passionate about. So if we started talking about all the creativity and all the amazing things you could do with code, and stop talking about code itself, 
then suddenly that'll start connecting to inspiration. We have to engage these girls. So how do you get them coding? So how do you start getting get them coding? So we started out, so when I said, you know, it kind of started out smaller and it just started getting bigger, at the beginning we had signed up to create one project for Google. It was the first one. It was actually creating, and this has never been done anywhere. If any of you have ever used 3D printing or printed anything three-dimensionally, you know that you go into a software, you create, you design whatever you're designing, and then you save out an SCL file. And then you take that escape an app that helps find lost jobs, and suddenly you save thousands and thousands of so you kind of start showing them the potential and power of code, and suddenly they connect to it. Suddenly they start seeing how amazing this thing, this tool is, and they start really wanting to learn it. And it's not that hard. It's not harder than math and physics and every other stupid thing that you learn at school. So it's actually really easy once you start going, because what we ended up doing is, so, you know, normally you see code in movies as like zeros and ones. What we did is basically we we designed an entire visual programming language called Blockly, and we had to have this happen. So it started out with just that one project and that we agreed to, and then slowly over, you know, I don't know how many months, Google added a second project and a third project and a fourth and a fifth, and then a thirteenth. So suddenly we will talk you through quickly the website, but if you actually want to see how the coding, and the deadline was still the same, I don't know about you guys, but it's kind of stressful. Um, so, you know, oops, sound. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Max. No, I was trying to juggle too many things. Okay, how should work now? The world. This is just kind of shows you how we redesigned this block link interface, and it's basically these little blocks that kind of fit into each other. And the you know, more you kind of advance with these projects, the harder they get. So through just over just layering up all these different blocks, you get to create these little avatars and characters. The world is made of you, a replicable, particular you, who are made of tiny bits and words thrown together, you whose effect can be enormous. Life-changing, history-making, world-ending. The code to change is also made of tiny bits and bytes drawn together into thick wells. Share a joke with millions. Bit directions. You are a girl who understands bits exist to be assembled. And then that's the bracelet that you got in the mail, with the packaging. And then you just start all these girls kind of post on Instagram their bracelets that they got. So lesson number nine is just say yes, just jump, just jump, just jump into the deep end, we'll figure itself out. Um, when you say no, you close yourself to opportunities, and when you say yes, you, even if you don't know how the hell to do it, you'll figure it out. You just get yourself with a bunch of We found, and this was like searching for a needle in a haystack, we had to find 12 women out in the world that actually code, six of them that were adults and then six of them that were under 18 and we could not find anybody it was like you can't just google women in technology a bunch of pull so we were literally especially for the younger girls we cold called every single school and organization we could think of to kind of try to find the most honestly this whole idea of corporations and the way they're structured and the politics and all that stuff all that stuff's going away it's going to be a whole generation that's going to be gone and then is going to be inventing their jobs. So whatever you want, you can do it. You can make it happen. You'll figure it out. And then the last and most important thing is surround yourself with awesome people and go on vacation. <laughs> vacation, very important. Do not 90 hours a week and every weekend like I did for 10 years. But Tesca works with robotics and code. Um, the Taggit girls created an app to help them clean up their community. Aya uh, has a company in New York that works with electricity and go code and helps kids kind of be inventors at a young age. Danielle works at Pixar and all the Pixar movies like Brave and Finding Nemo and Cars and all of those are all code. Erica is the one that works, leads innovation at UNICEF and helps women and children around the world, helps them not die of HIV and AIDS and a whole bunch of other things and uses code to make that happen. Robin works in gaming and code, Morale works in dance and code, and Lamar works in um, also kind of 
uh, hardware and code. So when you go play, it's never been. The more you experience, so how do good ideas, where do good ideas come from? They come from things coming together that haven't come together before. When you see an original idea, you're like, wow, that's really cool. Nor after creating um, an anthem film and some documentaries for ins inspiration, we have to engage these girls. So how do you get them coding? So how do you start getting get them coding? So we started out, so when I said, you know, it kind of started out smaller and it just started getting bigger, at the beginning we had signed up to create one project for Google. It was the first one. It was actually creating, and this has never been done anywhere. If any of you have ever used 3D printing or printed anything 3D, you know that you go into a software, you create, you design whatever you're designing, and then you save out an SCL file. And then you take that SCL file and go to a company like Shapeways, you upload it, and then... Yes. <laughs> Girls, so they don't get discouraged, we not only created a visual block based type um, coding language, but we also created this project that basically these girls can go in, choose the color, diameter, art director, creative director on, and basically um, in advertising you work with a partner, so you work with a writing partner, and what you do is you come up with the idea of whatever that commercial is going to be, and then you basically you know, kind of make it happen. So, so for example, I'll take I Feel Pretty for example, so we came up with the idea for that commercial, we wrote a script for it, we kind of did a little storyboard for it, and then basically what we do is we bring on a team of people to help do this. You hire a director, you hire a production company, you hire an editor, you hire a sound person, you, you work with a composer. To, basically, we created that entire track. We re-recorded that entire track of the song in the composer to basically time out to make a 60 second. And then we shot all the visuals. So basically, you're kind of laying, I don't know if you know a lot about music, but you, you lay a track and then you basically shoot all the visuals it's timed out exactly to how you want the whole thing to play out. So my role in a lot of these is basically coming up with the idea and then kind of having the vision to oversee them. So uh, coming from out of the United States and like jumping into the huge world of like advertising and I don't know, I'm not articulate really, but like I know that. Um, bracelet project, and you actually got to lock. Like these companies that are so globally present, was that like weird? It was there like a cultural, like aspect that you had to get used to. Like I don't know, you said maybe with like Coke or something that large, where they like push their image on everybody. Is that like different coming from where you're from? So your question is. Like, was that is that like, I don't know. That's kind of the hard part. It's just voice question, <laughs> but. Yeah, you should. But just <laughs> really speak on that, like how um, how different, or if there's a difference. You know what? I don't think the the brand thing is a weird thing because brands are brands, right? Yeah. Like Google and Coke and whatever, they're all over the world, and you see them, you see them going up, you see them everywhere. And I feel like, especially where I grew up, Beirut, like Beirut, we watched, you know, every single show that you watched growing up. You know, mm -hmm. TVs everywhere and satellites everywhere, and you, you just get all these shows, you know. So we grew up with the same stuff, you know. Yeah. But the the we just didn't have the actual physical experience of living in the states, you know. So there are, for example, and this happens now that I've been living here for a long time. I I totally like feel more American than anyone back from here to there. I noticed that they're always trying to speak with my friends there in American slang, and they don't get it, or they make jokes about things. And my friends are they speak fluent American English. Live here. Yeah. Sometimes those jokes kind of just go over their heads. They're like, like somebody's like, "Oh, you're such a nerd," and they're like, <laughs> "Such a nerd." Anyway, stuff like that. But yeah. going back to the global thing, no, it's not. It's not weird. Coke, just because you brought Coke is the most painful client to work for ever. <laughs> not because of the cultural difference. It's just a painful. Yeah. Like I worked on a, an Olympics um, Coke project, and it was probably the most painful project. <laughs> It's just so corporate and so hard to get any work approved. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> I guess I just know that like in other cultures, like the way we advertise and the way we push imagery and stuff can be like crazy compared to like I know in Europe they don't do commercials the same way we would do it. So mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah.
I was wondering if you could talk more about the vacations and the traveling that you've done and how that has influenced your work. If there's any direct correlations or if it's just like a mindset. Um, I think the more you experience, um, and I think traveling is just a really, really interesting way to experience things, especially when you go places you've never been. The more you experience, so how do good ideas, where do good ideas come from? They come from, that's like the really important key bit there because, you know, if you're trying to connect to somebody's like, I don't know, trying to make them more compassion towards something and you connect to that human part, everybody's going to connect yeah. to it. It's not an American or a French or whatever thing. Cool. Thank you. Of course. Sure. I actually have a little paint after this. It'll take five minutes. I was just wondering, um, it seems like throughout your journey, um, you kind of look at news in a critical way and you were pulling from, you know, more. Yes. Yes. So. I was just going to ask, with like the commercials that you made, what exactly do you all such big ideas, or like when they're not familiar with what you're proposing? Um, so the commercials that I, sh uh, I showed, I was either art director or creative director on, and basically partners, so you work with a writing partner, and what you do is you come up with the idea of whatever that commercial is going to be, and then you basically, you know, kind of make it happen. So, so for example, I think at the end of the project, after a year and a half of working with them, they realized that I cared more about this project than they did. You know, just really making them realize that you have more of their interest. Like, I'm not fighting to try to get my ideas and sell my ideas. This isn't like, I just want to do what I want. It's not that. You know, it's more like, I, you're my client, and I'm trying to advise you, and this is based on my experience and what I think is right for you. Okay, one more question. One more question. One more question. So you said when you like first started going to school, you were going to be a doctor. And I was wondering, since you're obviously interested in science, are you still? Do you incorporate that into your work now, or <laughs> if you know what I was reading last night? Yeah, I read a lot about science. I love I love anything that has to do with the human body. I'm fascinated by the human body. Um, yeah, that's your question. I love it. Like, yeah, like my dad jokes that I will go to med school at some point. <laughs> he still jokes. He's like, but now you've traveled the world. Woo -hoo! Yeah. So it's okay if you get locked up in a hospital for hours on end. Discover the world. Check. <laughs> Okay, so I have one thing. I have some things to give you guys, some giveaways, but. You guys need to remember some lessons that I said. Do you need the overhead again? No, no, I'm good. They have to base it off of how different or if there's a difference. You know what? I don't think the the brand. Um, okay, so anybody remember what lesson number one was? Yes. Get up your hand. If you remember it, say it. Every single show that you watched growing up. You know, TVs everywhere and satellites everywhere, and you, you just get all these shows, you know. So we grew up with the same stuff, you know. Yeah. But the the we just didn't have the actual lesson number two. I guess you're out. You can get the ball. <laughs> you the ball. Yeah. But good work. Okay. Lesson number two. Like the way we advertise and the way we 
push imagery and stuff can be like crazy compared to like I know in Europe they don't do commercials the same way we would do it. So mm -hmm. I guess if that played any as like jumping into that and just being like, what the hell? This is also crazy or You know what? It's not crazy. The one thing that I will say is a lot of times when I'm thinking of stuff, I am thinking of things that try to connect with everybody everywhere. Yeah. That's definitely like I'm not basing it on language and I'm not basing it on you know, search or, you know, things that things people here will understand, but things yeah. abroad, you know, I'm definitely more aware that whatever the idea I'm coming up with, I'm trying to make it more global. I'm trying to make it like, and I think the way I do that is if you connect it to something human, then anybody anywhere is going to connect to it. And I think that's like the really important key bit there because, you know, if you're trying to connect to somebody's like, I don't know, trying to make them feel more compassion towards something and you connect to that human part, Everybody's going to connect yeah. to it. It's not a <laughs> um, Okay, then lesson number six. Yes. Yeah, very close. I'll give that to you. Make yourself vulnerable. But you got it because it's about being personal, totally. Um, lesson number seven. Trust your gut, and then your gut will get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not yet. Not yet. Always say yes. No, that comes a little later. Not with mine. <laughs> well, you already got one, so. You can get a treat. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, it relates to the yoga experience. Oh. Good. Oh. Trust your gut? No. <laughs> Doing things you thought were impossible. Things you impossible think? with your body and then they're impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you think things that you think are impossible aren't always impossible, but then you can do them. <laughs> <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> Doing things that are impossible make you think that anything is possible. So There we go. You get it. You get I it. think I nailed it. You can try it. <laughs> okay, lesson number eight. Somebody said it a little while ago. The gut. Yeah, and the more you trust your gut, the more you trust your gut. That's what you were saying. Oh my god. Okay, and then you said, say yes. Okay, that's lesson number nine. Jump, you'll figure it out later. Lesson number 10, <laughs> if you know what I was reading last night. Yeah, I read a lot about science. I love I love anything that has to do with the human body. I'm fascinated by the human body. Um, yeah, is that an answer to your question? I love it. Like, yeah, like my dad jokes that I will go to med school at some point. <laughs> he still jokes. He's like, but now you've traveled the world. Woohoo! Yeah. So it's okay if you get locked up in a hospital for hours on end before you discover the world. Check. Okay, so I have one thing, things to give you guys, some giveaways, but you guys need to remember some lessons that I said. Do you need the overhead again? Um, no, no, I'm good. They have to base it off of memory. And if uh, you guys remember, then you get some. <laughs> Um, okay, so anybody remember what lesson number one was? Yes. You can put your hand up. So. If you remember it, say it. He's like, I wrote it down. And I put my hand up because you were finishing. So. <laughs> lesson number one is a career is not a linear path. Experiences will add up to something bigger. Awesome. Nice work. Nice work. So remember to come up here. Done to get a to pick a goodie. Okay, lesson number two. I guess you're out. You can get the ball. You're them all down. But good work. Okay, lesson number two. Oh, you started out right. Think about it for a second. Put your energy in the right place and the rest will figure itself out. Got it. Good, good, nice work. Okay. Uh, lesson number three. Take a job for what you will learn and you don't need. Awesome. Yay! <laughs> okay, 
Um, lesson number four. Yes? No, that was part of it. That was later. <laughs> 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 lesson number four. Anyone? Yes. Was it travel? Was it that one? No. <laughs> it has to do with travel. What happened when I traveled? Before I traveled, what happened? Oh. Uh, yeah. Your mind and your perspective? Yes, but what was Your clothes. <laughs> what did I do to reset my perspective? <laughs> you took a risk. Yes. So the lesson is the best things in life are liberating and terrifying. It's all about taking risks. Lesson number five. Now somebody was talking about it. Uh, try again. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Close. What was the lesson behind travel? Yeah, but so what was the lesson? The value of time off. <laughs> yes. Yeah, very close. I'll give that to you. It's make make yourself vulnerable. But you got it because um, lesson number seven. To trust your gut, and then your gut will get bigger. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not yet. Always say yes. No, that comes a little later. Well, that was mine. <laughs> well, you already got one, so you're going to get a treat. Anyone? Um, it relates to the yoga experience. Oh, trust your gut? No. <laughs> Doing things you thought were impossible. Yeah, do things impossible you think. with your body. And then they're impossible, they're impossible, but then you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> Doing things that are impossible make you think that anything is possible. So, there we go. You get it. Okay, lesson number eight. Somebody said it a little while ago. The gut. Yeah, and the more you trust your gut, the more you trust your gut. Yep. Okay, and then who said? Say yes. Okay, that's lesson number nine. Jump, you'll figure it out later. Lesson number ten. No, that was before. That one worked your ass off and magic will happen. That's the next one. I'll give it to you. That's number eleven. That's number ten. The more you take risks, the more you yes, take risks. Yes, but you already got a tree. You have to give oh, it to somebody. Oh, I didn't know I, I was going to get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who said magic happens when you work your ass off? And then what was number 12? That's number 13. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to you. What's number 12? Yes, you can't find the perfect job. You have to invent it. Awesome, guys. Yay! So all the people, the first thing people that said um, a lesson, you can come up and shoot one of these posters. <laughs>